Good morning. Week 14. Can you believe it? As we uh, make our way to the end of the semester and the end of the school year, a lot of fatigue in the air, a lot of sense of being overwhelmed. And, and just know that we are praying for you, um, campus pastors, your staff, your faculty, and chapel programs. We are praying for you for God's strengthening and sustenance. Um, before I introduce uh, today's speaker, um, as many of you are probably aware, um, over the weekend, um, there were a, a couple of earthquakes in the world, one in Ecuador and then actually two in Japan over the weekend. Um, and there was loss of life and fatalities in both of those. And I want to let everybody know that all of our APU students in Ecuador at Study Abroad in Ecuador are safe and are in places that are not affected. Um, but um, I did think it would be appropriate for us to uh, pray, especially for first responders and EMS um, as rescue efforts are still, um, are still going on, both in Ecuador and Japan. So would you join me in this prayer? Merciful Father, we commend to your protection all those who are working in both Ecuador and Japan to bring rescue and relief especially firefighters and police, paramedics, emergency personnel, volunteers. Father, give them courage in danger. Give them skill in difficulty. Give them compassion in service. Sustain them with physical strength and calmness of mind that they may perform their work for the well-being of those in so need, that their lives may be saved and communities may be restored. God, we pray this in the strong name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Um, this morning, um, I'm excited to introduce to you one of my friends and colleagues. She is a professor um, in our Department of Practical Theology. She's a professor of youth ministry um, in our School of Theology. And uh, she has a PhD in, from Fuller Theological Seminary. And so would you please welcome Cheryl Crawford. Uh, hey, y'all. It is so nice to be here with you, but I do have to say, I kind of miss my home turf, West Campus, so let me shout out to y'all. Wish I could see you, but I got you in my mind's eye, okay? Just so you know, eyes on it. Also, I want to thank um, much of the research that I've done on the topic I'm going to be talking about today is a result of the contributions of students in my senior seminar class, and so I deeply want to thank you all for your insights, your engagement. I see you out there um, both last year and this year. You all are awesome. And those of you who I see today, your grade just increased. So just so you know, you know, you got an A on the way, you know. Okay. So seriously, um, and you know, I, I realize we're in the 14th week, right, of semester. And I know that's really stressful for y'all. So, you know, I want to take that into account. And I want you to hear what I have to say today as not a to-do list, as not something to, you know, put something else on your already too long list of things you got to accomplish by the time you walk away from here in May, right? I want you to hear this as a heart message, as something to consider, right? Some way of thinking about how we do life, because honestly, that's what we do in our senior sem, is to talk about what will life look like, right? And so hear it as that and not to-dos. Okay, so possibly unlike you, I have a bit of a storied past. I know, doesn't look like that, but I do. Some regrets, some events, even some conversations I wish I had done differently. You know, I grew up in Boston in the Northeast. Thank you. And I am trying to embody that today. You might notice this is, this is New England right here coming at you. But the interesting thing about the Northeast, and this was, you know, in the time I was growing up, I swear we were still fighting the Civil War. You know, it's like, we did not like Southerners. I was taught to not like Southerners. And it was just, it was horrible, not respect or like. And so, when new neighbors moved in to the neighborhood with Maryland license plates, there was a bit of turmoil in my neighborhood, right? They seemed different. 
They spoke with a drawl that never seemed to end. Their words just went on forever. And they went to church, a Baptist church. I know, thank you for that. (laughs) Well, one Sunday during the summer preceding my seventh grade year, my brother and I constructed a skateboard from a small rectangular piece of plywood and a divided pair of roller skates. This is really high tech, right? Those were my trucks to the bottom of the, yeah, we attached this stuff, and this was a little precarious, right? And then being really smart Bostonians, we decided we could create a magnificent ride by having my brother ride his Stingray bicycle, towing me on the skateboard with a 10-foot rope, right? How smart is that? Well, our street was pretty level, so, you know, things began well. Things were going okay. But then my brother decided we should disrupt our new neighbors, Sunday picnic lunch, by riding through their U-shaped driveway, right? So we entered on one street, rode right by them as they're eating dinner, and then exited out the other end of the driveway. Now, you have to realize that with roller skate trucks, it's really loud. It's obnoxious, right? And of course, we were whooping it up and just being obnoxious kids. And you know what? They smiled and they waved at us. There was something really different about these people, really different. Because otherwise, I mean, my parents would have gotten up. I hope my dad's not listening. Anyway, they would have gotten up and yelled, right? This was not normal. Well, this was my first exposure to what it meant to celebrate Sunday and set it apart. Because in my world, I grew up in an unchurched home. And the Northeast is not known for being very religious or very Christian, right? So I grew up in a whole different way of life. And so to see people spending time together, eating together, talking together, these folks actually didn't even buy anything on Sundays. They were that committed to setting Sunday apart. So fast forward four decades, right? And I find myself focusing my research on why so many people are leaving the church today. Is it because, as David Kinneman reports in his book, Unchristian, people are running for the doors, right, viewing the church as homophobic, right-winged, judgmental, too focused on salvation and hypocritical? Or perhaps the reasons that people run for the, ch- for the doors of church are the reasons that students gave me when I was doing sticky faith um, interviews, when I was interviewing college students about why they were leaving the church, right? And they gave me three reasons. One was the Catholic Church's issue with sexual abuse, which was recently documented in the movie Spotlight. If you really want to understand why so many people have left the church, that's really, that is so core, particularly to those in the Northeast, because that's where most of this happened. The second one was the way the American church has dealt with the issue of homosexuality. This has bothered so many college students, and they literally have walked out the doors. And then thirdly, not understanding how a good God might allow innocent people to suffer, right? Each one, each and every one of these concerns actually has some degree of validity. Think about, we just talked about the earthquakes in Ecuador and Japan, and you see the disaster and you see children being pulled from rubble. It's really hard to understand how a good God allows that to happen. And so for many college students, they struggle with that. And again, they drop their faith. They're done. They just don't get it. But perhaps Fuller President Mark Laberton actually identifies and calls out the key issue in his recent book, Called. Laberton proposes that the church and we Christians have lost our identity, right? And therefore our calling. That we don't know who we are anymore. Leverton asks, will the church embody and articulate its only legitimate identity? Followed by, will God's people live as followers of Jesus? And so Leverton later suggests that if Christians actually followed Jesus as true disciples, right? People who would, would be drawn to the church and Christians like a bee's drawn to honey. In other words, if we really embraced our relationship and our identity as Christ followers, what would it look like? Would that change this incredible trend of people leaving the church? So what does that mean? I mean, what does that mean for us and how do we get there? And I have one suggestion, and it's Sabbath. Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann 
declares in his remarkable book, Sabbath as Resistance. If you haven't read it, put it on your summer reading list. It's phenomenal. Sabbath is not the pause that refreshes. It's the pause that transforms. There's something transformational about Sabbath, Sabbath practice. So I spent a good deal of time lately considering Sabbath, meaning the past two to three years, and how it might transform us into true disciples of Jesus. And I want to share some of those thoughts with you in our remaining time today. You know, Genesis 1 and 2 uh, basically describes God's creation, right, and how all that happened. And basically, by the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it, he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. Now, when you first read this account, you might ask yourself, was God really tired? I mean, did he really need rest? You know, was there something about all that work that wore him out? I think not. I think what it gets down to is that God was setting a pattern for us, those created in his image, to follow. I think that's what Sabbath was about. So, beginning in Exodus 20, we find the lengthiest description contained in all of the Ten Commandments, right, with regards to Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle, or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Perhaps you might know Abraham Joshua Heschel. He's an American or was an American Hasidic Jewish theologian. That means a very conservative Jewish uh, theologian. He was the only Jewish person who actually walked with Martin Luther King from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama in 1965. He focused much of his life and work on understanding the meaning of Sabbath. So for Heschel, Sabbath orders our days in our lives. He argues that during creation, the only blessing God proclaimed was on Sabbath. Time, not space. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. So both Heschel and Brueggemann believe there is a significant distinction regarding God's concern for time and space. While we tend to occupy ourselves with accumulating stuff and expanding our space, our land, whatever we own, both encourage us to be more deliberate in our use of time, specifically observing Sabbath as a different and a sacred time. So, in 1951, over half a century ago, Heschel asserted the solution of humankind's most vexing problem will not be found in renouncing technical civilization, but in attaining some independence of it. 1951. We still had black and white TVs. We still had three channels on our TVs. No, you know, no cell phones, no computers. And yet he was calling out technology as perhaps an issue for us, as a challenge for us. So basically he is saying we need to reorient our lives, right? We need to focus, refocus. For Heschel, all of our life should be a pilgrimage to the seventh day. The thought and appreciation of what this day may bring to us should be ever present in our minds. He's basically reorienting the way we think about our weeks or our time. What we are depends on what the Sabbath is to us. How interesting. Many of us might dismiss these thoughts. They're Jewish, right? Somehow many of us Christians have allowed ourselves to dismiss our spiritual heritage, Judaism. And yet the Jewish roots of our Christian faith significantly inform how we are to live as Christ's followers. As a Galilean Jew, you know, Jesus most certainly kept the Sabbath. However, he, defi he redefined it for us. In Mark 2 and 3, we get some snapshots of how Jesus wanted us to reimagine 
the meaning of Sabbath. So first we read the story of Jesus and his disciple picking the heads of grain, right, as they pass through the grain fields on Sabbath, right? Totally going against Sabbath law. The Pharisees, as normal, as would be expected, challenged him. And his final response to them was, the Sabbath came into being for the sake of man and not man for the sake of Sabbath. And following this story, we find another story of Jesus healing a man with a withered hand in the synagogue, no less, right, on Sabbath. Imagine that. The message from both incidents, though, is the same. Sabbath was created for humans to flourish in our relationship with our creator. It's not about rules and regulations. It's the heart of Sabbath that we're called to in terms of reorienting ourselves to our maker. So we find ourselves today, right, 3,000 years, over 3,000 years from the original commandment to keep Sabbath, wondering how or even if we should keep Sabbath, if we should honor that commandment to keep and celebrate Sabbath. And although Jesus reordered our priorities, life over legalism, we still struggle. If Sabbath was made for humans, a gift from God to reorient ourselves to him, perhaps Brueggemann is right. Sabbath is not the pause that refreshes, it's the pause that transforms. What if, as Labberton suggested, we recenter ourselves and our identity to Christ as Christ followers, right? Will our friends and neighbors flock to join us in fellowship? What if the church becomes a place full of dynamic, Holy Spirit-driven Christ followers? What if it changes, overflowing with grace and love? Would so many run for the exit at first opportunity? I believe our lives would be transformed if we reoriented our time, taking a day each week to celebrate our great God by worship and fellowship. I think being involved in a local church is one step, one of the first steps, but considering Sunday a different day might be the other side of that coin. And what does that look like? You know, what does that look like in the 21st century? Well, you know, for the more conservative Jews, uh, Shabbat begins in the preparation, right? Leading up to Shabbat, which begins at sunset, traditional Jewish people scurry about preparing for all the details of a day with no work. That means all the food is prepared ahead of time, candles are prepared, bread is baked, all leading up to the lighting of the candles 18 minutes before sunset. Once the candles are lit, the host motions for the flame's aroma to envelop them, praying, blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with the commandments and commanded us to kindle the light of the holy Shabbat. The shalom of Shabbat has begun. The work week, the week full of activity and distractions and busyness is set aside for 24 hours. No work occurs on Shabbat, which lasts from sunset to sunset. Fellowship, including meals and conversation, are the mainstay of Shabbat. Reconnecting with our creator and our sisters and brothers is core to Shabbat. If Jesus celebrated Sabbath, and it truly is transformational, how do we as Christ followers celebrate Sabbath? What practices might we engage in in the 21st century that would open ourselves up to the work of the Spirit? What things might we do? Each of us has to look into our own hearts, obviously. There's no rule book. And find ways to fully engage our God, to commit ourselves to weekly focusing on practices that will draw us closer to him and provide opportunity for our spirits to connect with the Holy Spirit, right? Without interruption, without all the distractions that cause us to lose our focus and our orientation to God. Perhaps we have become more self-absorbed, less considerate, more task-oriented than people-oriented. Maybe we've become more judgmental, homophobic, political, and self-righteous. Could Sabbath be a solution to help us become more like Jesus? This is a question I've been struggling with the past couple of years. What would it look like? What would it look like? 
Well, 3,000 years ago, you know, much time was spent collecting water, farming, and gathering food, making fire, and sustaining one's dwelling, right? I mean, you had to walk to the well to get your bucket full and carry it back, and you had to, you had to plant and take care of your fields. Basically, there was a lot of work. It took a lot of work to simply sustain life, and that's not true today. So to celebrate Sabbath, for us, is it gonna require the same things, right? Or not doing the same things. The things that occupied the ancient Hebrews or Israelites, time, energy, and thoughts are very different than what occupies us. Today's world, I think we have many, many distractions. Our lives, our thoughts, our focus, our conversations, every aspect of our lives is constantly interrupted. Now, I don't wanna name names, or call out contributors, but, to the constant interruptions in our lives, but, as we often say, it is what it is, right? I believe the cell phone, I know, (gasps) just felt the air go out, which seems to be so helpful in so many ways, is also the nemesis of our lives. I know we all connect in many, many ways by means of our cell phone, right? But at the same time, it's the single possession that because it has so many functions and capabilities and apps, so many modes of connectivity, it continually demands our attention. All those notifications coming in from Twitter to Snapchat to Facebook to Instagram, texts from friends who are sitting bored in class so they decide to sneak a text under the desk. I've seen it. And those those little notifications, right? They spark your curiosity. We have to look. You gotta look, right? I'm afraid that FOMO, yep, the fear of missing out, has become a very prevalent disease among us. It just about kills me to not look at my phone if it vibrates with the notification. I mean, I'm going crazy not looking at it. It takes so much discipline to not check it. And I didn't grow up with a cell phone. I'm not a digital native. So I can only imagine the challenge for you all, right? I am still tempted to regularly check in with my fifth appendage. Last December, Deloitte released results regarding cell phone use in the United States, right? Americans check their cell phones eight billion times a day. For millennials, that comes down to 74 times per day, average. That's you all. It's a lot of distraction, right? It's a lot of distraction. So when we think about Sabbath and how best to be fully present with our great God and those with whom we do life with, how do we manage the primary distraction of our lives? I got a couple of thoughts. Although fasting typically refers to refraining from some form of food or drink, right, for religious reasons, Christians seem to embrace a broader description, we usually see this around Lent, which would include abstaining from some activities or practices in order to focus our attention more on God, right? I wonder what would happen if we incorporated some form of fasting in terms of our cell phone activity, right? What if we fasted from email or Twitter or Facebook or Snapchat or Instagram and we turned off the notifications? would Sabbath once again become transformational for us? Multitasking is an urban myth. We are either attending, you know, paying attention to one thing or another. So if our Sabbath is continually interrupted, we lose focus of the gift that God has given us. So on the one hand, perhaps engaging some form of cell phone fasting, right? On the other hand, making ourselves available to God and others by focusing and listening with intention. Listening to others with that intention to build relationship. Listening to God through prayers and reflection and listening for God through the voices of others. It's hard to do that when your phone is constantly going off. It's hard to focus when that continually happens. You know, this this academic year has been a bit more challenging than usual for me. In August, right before APU started, my 19-year-old nephew and my 89-year-old father both came to live with me. I love them both deeply. Let me just say that. But life changed from being pretty predictable 
to pretty chaotic and just interruptions, constant interruptions. I can hear my father yelling for me out of the back of my head here needing something. I needed to create more time in my life. I needed to better organize and refocus my time. And so I decided that I would not do emails on Sundays. I thought, no emails. That's it. Shutting them down. I apologize to students who send emails on Sunday. But anyway. But the interesting thing, I think it's kind of interesting. The only email I sent on Sunday was on Easter Sunday this year when I sent an email to my senior seminar class extending the due date for their papers. But... <laughs> Yes. See, the one exception. Well, there's got to be an exception to every rule, right? So there it was. But even Rabbi Heschel back in 1951 acknowledged that we do not need to renounce technology, but rather we need to become more independent of it. And I believe fasting from some of our cell phone activity might be a step in the right direction, right? So can Sabbath be transformational, as Brueggemann suggests? I think so. But we need to make decisions about how we prioritize how we celebrate Sabbath, right? Like what we do. So back to the beginning. The skateboard incident that was the beginning of a huge wake-up call for this spiritually lost girl. I was so impressed with how my southern neighbors treated others, how they respected and listened so well. And I realized it was directly related to their relationship with God and their Sabbath practices, the way they took time out for themselves, for God, and for others. My neighbors became not only great friends, but the people who led me to Christ on June 11th of my junior year of high school, five years after the skateboard incident. Their Sabbath practices led them to a deeper, seemingly more significant relationship with him, with both God and others. They were Christ followers, and I was drawn to Christ by virtue of their living testimony, right? This photo was taken about eight years ago when I reunited with them at their Florida home. They're wonderful, wonderful people and uh, obviously changed the trajectory of my life. One final note. I was on the Outer Banks in North Carolina a few years ago with a large group of friends. Has anybody been there, Outer Banks, North Carolina? Oh, yeah, it is good. If you haven't, put it on the to-do list, I'm telling you. One morning, I woke up really early and decided to try out my rental Jeep on the beach. Because in North Carolina, many people drive and park on the beach, as long as it's four-wheel drive. And uh, not exactly like Newport Beach, but um, they're very long stretches of sand, and it's absolutely beautiful. At any rate, I am cruising down the long sandy beach when a National Park Service officer stops me to tell me I cannot go any further. Evidently, a female loggerhead turtle had come up onto the beach to lay her eggs the night before, right? And she got lost. She became disoriented. And you could see the paddle marks on the sand. It's like these little, you know, it's like, it literally looks like a paddle mark. And she was going in circles. She was totally lost on this very wide beach. So a small group of early morning adventurers gathered together with the National Park Service officers to help this loggerhead get back home. It's just not that simple, though. She could not be coaxed. She could not be corralled. She needed to be carried, and all 500 pounds of her. So the National Park Service folks covered her head with a wet towel, just preserving any, any type of hydration she had, and six people gathered around her, lifting her gently off the sand. It was quite a ways from the water, so it took a long time, a lot of breaks, a lot of rest stops, 500 pounds. But when she was set down at the water's edge, the most amazing thing happened. You can see it in this photo. Once the towel was removed, she lifted her head, and as she smelled the salt water, she slowly moved towards it. We stood mesmerized as she entered the water and disappeared. That sweet smell of the ocean, a scent she recognized, right, drew her safely home. In 2 Corinthians 2.15, Paul declares, For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. I want to be that sweet aroma that draws people to Jesus. Maybe it's because I believe every human has a God-shaped hole in their lives, but I believe 
everybody has that hunger, right? And if we can present the true nature of who Jesus is, I think people will be drawn to him. It's my hope that we continue to honor Sabbath, that we will be transformed and thereby become the sweet aroma and that others recognize as sourced in Jesus. And then maybe they too will find their way home. Let me do a quick prayer and then we'll get out of here. Father God, thank you for who you are. Father, who you've called us to be. Give us the wisdom, God, to discern how to best become reoriented to you. In your name, amen. I see I